Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to believe everyone can hear me. We are welcome to Believers Hangouts again tonight. It's so good to see every one of us. I hope our week has started in a great manner. And I pray that the Lord whom we have come to hang out with, to see tonight, to hear from tonight, I pray the Lord will give us an amazing encounter through his word in the name of Jesus. Um, so again, as always, we always have a lot to talk about, you know, whenever we come together like this, because we have a short moment. So I'm going to go ahead uh, straight into the teaching. If you are not here last week, we wrapped up our series on the power of covenants. Because of time, I won't be able to do a recap. Please do well to go to our YouTube channel and listen to that teaching. It's a very, very important and powerful teaching. It's a two-part series teaching us on the concept of covenants, how we can make effective covenants, and how we can benefit by making covenants with the Lord. And I did mention uh, last week while I was taking that second part that um, we're going to be doing a short series, uh, hopefully not more than a two-part series, on the concept of the mercy of God. Because while we were doing that teaching um, on the power of covenant, I did explain that um, covenant is a legalistic term, right? Because a covenant is a contract. And in contract, there is a need for both parties to adhere to the terms of the contract for the covenant or the contract to remain binding. So if you do not keep your part of the deal, by law, there should be a judgment that should be meted out to you. There should be a judgment that you know, should come to you on the basis of defaulting and violating the terms of the covenant. But I did explain also last week that sometimes, sometimes because of, um, you know, factors beyond our control, sometimes because there was not a lot of wisdom in the first place, you know, in the um, design of the covenant, sometimes we make covenant with God that we are unable to keep our part of the deal, that we are unable to meet up, you know, with doing what's our own responsibility. And if we do not un balance our understanding of covenants with the understanding of the mercy of God, there is a very good chance that the devil will take advantage of that ignorance and bring us into disadvantage. And that was what we saw in the life of Jephthah, for example. He made a covenant with God. You know, he said, God, if you protect me, you know, as I'm going to battle, I'm going to offer to you anything that comes out of my house to meet me, right? At the time he was making that covenant, you know, he was desperate. He wasn't even sure he was going to come back alive. He was like, nothing was going to work. So he was just desperate. He just wanted results by all means. So he, 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 he made, you know, a promise that he, he ended up not being able to keep. But because he didn't understand the concept of the mercy of God, he ended up sacrificing his only daughter. And that was not the will of God. Because if you study this, the scriptures and you understand the nature of God, you know that God does not accept human sacrifices. But that was something that Jephthah did not understand. And I'm, you know, taking time to reemphasize this because sometimes as believers, you know, in that, in the, when we are in that, you know, religious zeal or that religious um, mindset, it's very, very easy for us to begin to deal with God in a legalistic manner. And that's very dangerous because if the basis of your relationship with God is all about legalism, it's all about rules and regulations, the moment you default, you see the danger of being legalistic, being a legalistic Christian is that the basis of your righteousness then becomes your works. So you believe that the reason God is why God is pleased with you is because of something that you did or, you know, some sacrifices that you made or, you know, some consecrations that you keep. But that is not the case. And in fact, Jesus was making this correction in the life of the Pharisees. And he was pointing out how that, you know, the basis of the confidence of the Pharisees is their works. So they will come to God and they will be, instead of, you know, humbling themselves and seeking for God's mercy, they come before God and they are, re you know, releasing their credentials. And say, oh, I fast three times a week. I give alms to the poor. You know, I do this, I do that. And they believe that the reason why God should pay attention to them is because of those things that they do. But that is not the way God works. Yes, God operates is a justice system. But God does not want us to be legalistic believers who then believe that the basis of anything we receive from God are the works that we do. Because if that becomes our mindset, then the finished word of Christ becomes of no effect. It becomes of no effect because if the basis of your righteousness becomes the things that you do or the things you do not do, then the sacrifices of Jesus 
becomes null and void in your life. So it is important for us as we, you know, seek to be believers who understand the justice system of God and take advantage of the justice system of God, which is very important. But as we are understanding that, it's also important for us to understand the place of the mercy of God and how we can enjoy the provisions of the mercy of God to our advantage. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So the title of today's teaching is The Power of God's Mercy. The Power of God's Mercy. We are going to look at Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. It's a very popular scripture. Please, I want to encourage you. This is a very, very important teaching that every believer must know and understand. So anything that will fight your concentration and attention at this time, please do your best to get rid of it because the Lord is about to speak to you. Lamentations chapter 3. We're going to read verse. I'm going to read from King James Version. Lamentations chapter 3 from verse 22. It says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23 says, They are new every morning. That's the mercy of God now. It says, Great is your faithfulness. So what the scripture is saying basically is that on a daily basis, as far as the justice system of God is concerned, there are more than enough reasons for us to be destroyed. There are more than enough reasons for us to be consumed because we default in so many areas. And it's very easy because when you, when you really think about it and you take a catalog of your day, you know, your week, you will find out that many times God is trying to get you to do something but either because you are not sensitive enough or you even know, but you are not willing to yield to the Holy Spirit at that point. There are many things that God wants us to do. God is trying to get us to do that we just ignore, that we just refuse to do. And the Bible says to him that knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. So every time you disobey the, you disobey the Holy Spirit, it is a sin, right? Every time God gives you an instruction and you refuse to yield, to the will of God, it is a sin. So, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, you know, the Lord. So every time that we, 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 we falter, we should be judged. But this scripture is telling us that the reason why we do not get judged immediately we falter is because of the Lord's mercy. And the idea is that we will become reasonable enough to then, you know, align more to the Holy Spirit. So the basis of the mercy of God, among other things, is to get us to the point where we become reasonable believers. And we say, oh, if God has been so merciful to me this much, despite the fact that I did not deserve it, then I will give him my best. That is the point that God is trying to get us to. But let it become a settled reality in your heart and in your mind that no matter how righteous you are, no matter what you do for God, no matter your works, no matter the acts of faith that you engage in, the fundamental reason why you are not consumed, why God does not release you to, to, to the will of the devil is because of his mercy. So this concept of mercy is a very, very important key that every single believer must understand. You know, sometimes as believers, we, we, we believe or think that the subject of the mercy of God is only for sinners, right? When you, in fact, there are, there are some Christian circles that they don't even want to hear anything about God's mercy mercy, you know, especially in legalistic Christian circles, where they believe that the basis of their righteousness is their works. So they tell you God is good to me because I fast three days a week. They tell you God is faithful to me because I don't commit sin. I don't fornicate. And when they say I don't commit sin, <laughs> what they mean most times is I don't fornicate. You know, I don't sleep with other men's wives. You know, I don't steal all these so-called big and obvious sins. But the same person who is claiming to be sinless is a liar. The same person who is claiming to be sinless is a hypocrite. The same person who is claiming to be sinless, you know, disobeys the Holy Spirit on a consistent and continual basis. So many believers who think that the mercy of God is, is, is for sinners are people who do not have, uh, they do not see the full scope and they, they have not studied the full scope to, to receive the full understanding and the full purpose and the full dynamics of the mercy of God. Because when you truly understand the mercy of God, you will know that, Regardless of your salvation status, you need you, you are helplessly, we are all helplessly dependent on the mercy of God each day. So you that's why we are not afraid to ask for mercy. So the, the idea of, oh, I only ask for mercy because I sinned, it's not scriptural. We need continual access to the mercy of God. And we are still going to talk about, you know, all of that, you know, why God's mercy is so important and all of that. Okay, but let it become a settled reality in your heart that the mercy of God is an indispensable 
reality, an indispensable tool that we need to live successfully here on earth as believers. I pray the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing I want us to just major on, which is going to be the bulk of our discussion this evening, is the basis of God's mercy. I want us to you know, go through scripture and understand the basis of God's mercy. Because you see, if we do not understand how God administers mercy and why God administers mercy, it's our, our approach to mercy may not be accurate. Our understanding of mercy may not be accurate. And if our understanding of mercy is not accurate, then we may not be able to really benefit maximally from the provisions of the mercy of God. All right. Now, the first thing we must understand about the mercy of God is that the basis for which God administers mercy is actually the blood of Jesus. But I want us to read the scripture first um, so that we can understand how God thinks. Psalms 89. Let's read Psalms 89 so that we can understand the systems of God and why God does and how God does what he does. Psalms 89, we're going to read from verse 14. Now, the Bible says here in Psalms 89, verse 14, it says, righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. It says, unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. So this scripture is clearly revealing to us that the foundation, the fundamental bedrock of God's um, system of rulership, of God's throne, of God's uh, system of judgment is righteousness and justice. So God is many things, right? You know, as believers, you know, as you, you, you are, we are learning the new creation realities, understanding who we are in Christ. One of the things we must understand is that God is our father. So Jesus, for example, when he was teaching his disciples, you know, to pray, he says, when you pray, pray in this manner, say our father who is in heaven. In other words, he's trying to get them to understand that when you are, when you are relating with God as a believer in Christ, your relationship is fundamentally for, you know, from the perspective of a father to a child. So you have to see God as your father because God is many things. You know, it's just like many of us who are here, you know, right now we are all uh, members of a fellowship, right? That's a that's a cap that we are in. But individually, some of us are students. Some of us are, you know, professors. Some of us are, you know, professionals. Some of us are fathers. So you are many things. So you as an individual, you can be different things to different people. So the same person who is the president of a nation is a father to somebody, you know? The same person who is the president of a nation is a son to somebody. So in the, in the same way, God is many things. But for us who are saved, you know, God is our father. For the entire creation, God is creator, right? And God is also the judge of all the earth. So God has many offices. And for us to really you know, maximally enjoy our relationship with God, we need to deal with God on the basis of the office that he is occupying at the moment. But on the basis of relationship, we approach God as father. However, you have to understand that although God is your father, he is also a judge. You know, even in the natural sense, if your father is a, a, a judge in a court of law and then you commit a crime, the fact that he is your father doesn't mean you just get away with the crime for no reason. And so my father is the judge. So he just discharges me as, um, you know, I'm discharged and acquitted. No, the, the, the judgment will be appealed and your father may even be, be removed from his position because that is, that is not consistent with the law of justice, right? So you have to understand that God, although he is your father, he is also a judge because righteousness and justice form the bedrock of his throne. So, you know, the fact that, God is merciful, God is kind, God is love, and all of that, he does not veto his intrinsic fundamental nature of justice. That's why, for example, when God created man, you know, and put man in the garden, he gave man an instruction. He said, all right, there is a tree. You can eat of every other tree in the garden, including the tree of life. He said, but you do not, I do not want you to eat of this tree that contains the knowledge of good and evil. And he, he told him the consequence. He says, the day you eat out of this tree, you will die. So on the basis of God's justice, the moment man partook of that fruit and man ate of that tree, man should have died both spiritually and physically. But because of the love nature of God, because of his nature of mercy, because you have to understand that God has many natures and God is multidimensional. But God will not say, because I am loving and I am merciful, I cancel the judgment that I have 
attached to this sin just because I am God, just on the basis of my sovereignty. If God were to do that, God will become unrighteous. God will become unjust. And that is the fallacy of, you know, people who have the notion that if God is truly loving, if God is truly kind, then why should he send anybody to hell? Then I should be free to do whatever I want. I should be able to live however I like. I should be able to go to parties, you know, sleep with as many people I like, live my life without the knowledge of God. And God should still welcome with me with open arms if truly he is a loving God. And you see, the problem with that philosophy and that line of thought is that these people do not understand that God is also a judge, you know? And the example, you know, I heard someone give this recently, which was brilliant, is, you know, if someone came and came to your house and God forbid, maybe raped your, 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 your daughter, your five-year-old daughter and killed her, and then they apprehended the person and took him to the, to the court of law. And you are in the court of law expecting justice. And the, the judge just says, well, I know this guy. He's my cousin. <laughs> oh, he's a very good friend of mine. So this case is discharged. You know, he's free to go. How would you feel? You will say this, this is injustice. This is unrighteous. This is wrong. You want to appeal that decision. So that is exactly what you're doing. If you decide that you want to live your life apart from God, you want to violate the laws of God, you want to violate the principles of God, and you still expect God to waive the judgment that is attached to your decisions of, you know, living lawlessly. That will be injustice on the part of God. That will make God an unrighteous judge. So because God cannot violate himself and he cannot violate his nature and he cannot, you know, veto his own, rule of justice what he now did was because he is also a loving god he's also a merciful god he now looked for a substitute to carry the punishment of that sin so that's why in the case of adam for example god transferred the sin of adam and his wife onto animals and that was where the first animal sacrifice was made so god slaughtered animals on their behalf the blood was dropped on the ground the, the, their sin was transferred to that animal and then god removed the skin of that animal and used it to clothe um, Adam and Eve. So basically, there was a transfer of the punishment, of the judgment. And that is actually how the mercy of God works. So for God to be able to administer mercy, the, the, the requirement of judgment must still be met. The, 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 the rule of judgment, but someone still has to pay the price. So that was why under the old covenant, eventually, I, and I hope we understand that this animal sacrifice of a thing in the old covenant, it didn't start under the Mosaic law, right? It didn't start after the children of Israel left Egypt and came into Canaan. No, it has been since Adam. All of the people who walked with God, from Abel to, you know, to, to Abraham, to, to just mention them, all of them understood animal sacrifice, including Enoch, right? So they understood that for the sin of man to be forgiven, for the sin of man to be, for the consequences of the sin of man to be taken away, it has to be transferred to another party. So it's the principle of substitution. So the basis of God's mercy is actually a substitute, is, is based on a substitution. So the demand for divine justice is still met. So when the devil comes and says, oh, this guy has sinned, for example, under the old covenant, God will say, well, he has sinned, but his sin has been transferred to this goat. And the goat has been killed. So the person who actually sinned is the goat. And the goat has died. So God then says, instead of this guy dying, I administer mercy. So the reason God can administer mercy and forgiveness is because someone or something else took the price. Now, because goats, you know, and I, I, I talked extensively about this, you know, sometime last year when we looked at the mystery of the blood, you know. And I really want to encourage you to listen to that teaching if you have not listened to it already. It's, it's available on our YouTube channel. The title is The Mystery of the Blood. So, you know, because of the limited capacity of goats and animals in general, it's impossible for the sin that was transferred to animals to have a permanent effect on sin. So because of that, God had to become a man and die for all men. I don't have time to go in, into all of that detail, but that was the idea. So for God to be able to now freely, without restriction, administer mercy to anybody today, the reason God can do that is because of that sacrifice of Jesus. Now let's look at that in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. Look at this. It says, I'll read from NLT. It says, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and the people and to the sprinkled blood, 
which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance like the blood of Abel. Now, what is happening here is this. You see, both Abel and Jesus were righteous men. The Bible, you know, records that. They were both righteous men. And the rule, as far as the justice system of God is concerned, is that sin can only be the, the, the punishment for sin can only be administered to the person who sinned. Let's look at that very quickly in Ezekiel chapter 18, just so we can have a robust understanding of why God does what he does as far as mercy, his administration of mercy is condemned. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. The Bible says here, it says, the person who sins is the one who will die. So this is the law of God. This is how God operates. So if there is no sin in you, if you do not sin, there is no legal reason why you should be punished, why you should be killed. Now, remember the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So the moment the person sins, they qualify for death. But that death can only be administered to the person who sins. It is illegal. It is unjust to punish an innocent man for a sin he did not commit. So in the case of Abel, he was innocent. He was righteous. And yet he was killed. So because of his status of righteousness, his blood cried out from the ground for justice. But in the case of Abel, the desire that he had was for judgment, was for vengeance. It was for revenge. And that's what the Bible is saying in that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. That what Abel's blood was requesting for is for judgment. But in the case of Jesus, when the blood of Jesus entered the ground, what it cried out for was mercy and forgiveness. And that's, that's, that is just remarkable. Just think about that. That you were killed, you were punished by the same people you tried to come and save, you, they spat on you, they recalled you, they did all kinds of nasty things against you. And yet at the end of it all, his blood was crying mercy. Father, forgive. Father, have mercy. Father, forgive. That's just to show you the depth of the love that God has for us. So that is the basis of the administration of God's mercy. It is based on the blood of Jesus. And to better understand this, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. How God arranged this formula for his mercy to be administered. Let's look at how it works. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16. Well, let me read from verse 15 so that we can understand how the new covenant actually went into effect. From verse 15, it says that is why he is the one, Jesus, now who mediates the new covenant between God and the people so that all who are, who are called, I'm reading from New Living Translation, by the way. He says so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance of that God has promised them. He says for Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins that they had committed under the first covenant. Now look at verse 15. He says now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. He says the will only goes into effect after the person's death. While the person who made it is alive, the will cannot be put into effect. He says that is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. So what the scripture is saying here is that the technology God uses for the administration of his mercy is by packaging it as a will, right? So in the case of Jesus, because Jesus died the death for sins he did not commit. So this is this is what happened in the case of Jesus. And this was <laughs> this is the, the powerful mystery behind the wisdom of God. You know, because the Bible says that the soul that sins is the one that must die. The devil has been looking out for how to kick Jesus out of the scene all the time. But he could not find anything in it. And Jesus actually testified. He says, the prince of this world comes to me, but found nothing in me. So Jesus, the devil had no basis to attack Jesus. He had no basis to kill Jesus because he could not find sin in him. But at some point, he just discovered that close to when he was going to Golgotha, he suddenly found out that this guy who has been righteous, who has been flawless, who has been sinless, suddenly he found a huge load of sin on him. And he saw that, wow, now I have a legal basis to kill this guy. And that's what the Bible was saying in, um, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, that it was saying that if the princes of this world had known the wisdom of God, he says they would not have crucified the prince of glory because they thought they were taking him off the scene, but they did not know that they were actually manifesting the wisdom of God. Because what God did was that he packaged the sin of every man that has ever lived and that we ever live, and then he put it on Jesus. So the sins that Jesus bore on the cross were not his personal sins. 
And according to the justice system of God, you can only be killed for your own personal sins. So Jesus carried the sin of everybody else except his own. And when the devil saw that, he quickly used the opportunity to kill Jesus. Now, here is now the thing. Because Jesus died unjustly, because Jesus died for a sin that was now his own, now he has the capacity to request for justice. Now, let me explain it this way. If you buy something on Amazon, let's say you ordered something, you ordered a phone, you ordered an iPhone, right? And you paid $1,000 for it. You are expecting to receive an iPhone. But two days later, you received a, a, a phone, maybe an iPhone, just the cover or just the screen protector, right? That is not worth more than maybe $5 or $10. Now, because what you received is not what you ordered, on the basis of justice, you are entitled to a refund. Now, you can decide to process your refund in different ways. You can decide to say, okay, I want my money back to my bank account, to my original payment method. You can decide and say, all right, I want my money as a gift card, as an Amazon gift card that I can use to make further purchases or that I can give to someone else to spend on my behalf. I want my money back, you know, or you can just say, I want the actual products that I requested. So, but as far as that situation is concerned you are entitled to some sort of reimbursement so it is now up to you to decide to decide how you want it now in the case of jesus because he was killed wrongly he was killed his death was unjust his death was unrighteous it was it was an unrighteous judgment so jesus was entitled to a refund in quote but in the case of jesus instead of asking for his life back Instead of asking for everything he lost, he now decides to say, um, instead of receiving that for myself, I choose to give it to everyone who believes in me. So the punishment, the death that everyone could have ever died, the moment they choose to believe in me, I choose to administer that pardon to them. I choose to administer that forgiveness to them. I choose to administer that mercy to them. And that is the reason why today God can decide to just show you mercy anyhow. Because Jesus has made it his will that when Jesus was dying, what he wrote down as his will in his blood is that everybody who believes in me, and that's what the Bible says in John chapter 3 verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, it's not for everybody, whoever believes in him should have eternal life. So even though the provision of salvation is available, it is only those who come into that relationship with Jesus that have access to that gift. So it's, it's, it's a very deep mystery in the spirit. So Jesus said, my will now is that everyone who believes in me, the punishment that they should have borne, I have borne it for them. Therefore, I give them my life. Therefore, I give them freedom. Therefore, I give them mercy. I pray the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. This is a profound revelation that when you understand, it will, it, will, it will deepen your love for God. Because when you understand the depth of God's love for you, when you understand how deeply the Lord loves you, that the, if God, and that's what the Bible says, that if God did not withhold his only begotten son, but gave him up for you and for me, he says, how will he not with him also freely give us all things? That this is the extent to which you are loved. So how then can the devil come to you and convince you that your life does not matter? How then can the devil come to you and convince you that you will fail? How then can the devil come to you and convince you that you are not loved, that you are not important? You know, I just wonder, you know, how people get to the point where even sometimes Christians, in quotes, get to the point where they say, I want to take my own life. I want to commit suicide. Like, do you not, do you not know the love of God for you? Do you not know the extent to which God loves you? When you understand the love of God and the depth to which God is willing to show you mercy, it will give you confidence and hope regardless of any season you are going through. Because you know it may be bad right now, but I know I will come out on the other side. I pray the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible now says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 that we should come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because this mercy is now freely available on the basis of the fact that Jesus has paid for it with his blood. So the blood of Jesus is the basis of the mercy of God. And because the blood of Jesus is infinite in scope, the mercy of God is also infinite in scope. So whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, it's in the evening, 
There is no limit to your capacity to access the mercy of God. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. We're going to go to the next up here. I'll just touch a couple of points there before we pray and then we'll continue from there next week. The next thing I want us to look at is why the mercy of God is so powerful. Why exactly is that we have understood, we have explained why, you know, the basis for the mercy of God. Now we want to look at why exactly the mercy of God is so powerful and why it is important for you and I to understand how the mercy of God works and take advantage of it. The first reason why the mercy of God or the understanding of the mercy of God is so powerful is because it can shield you from legitimate judgment. It can shield you from legitimate judgment. Let's look at James chapter two, chapter 2 verse 13. James chapter 2, verse 13. He says, For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has shown no mercy. He says, And mercy rejoices against judgment. Another version says, Mercy rejoices in victory against judgment. You see, the mercy of God has a capacity to override any judgment. The mercy of God has a capacity to overrule every judgment. If you know how to access the mercy of God, and you see, this was the secret of the life of David. He understood the mercy of God. You see, when you when you <laughs> when you when you think about David, for example, and you think about you know all the way he lived and all of the things he did, when you put David and Saul side by side, you will discover that Saul did not even do half <laughs> of the atrocities that David committed, and yet Saul was kicked out. But David was 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 was, was loved. God kept on recommending him. God kept on talking about him. Even several years, thousands of years after he was dead, God kept making reference to him. Why? Because he understood the mystery of the mercy of God and he took full advantage of it. When you understand the mercy of God, you see, the mercy of God, the way the mercy of God works, right, is like an insurance system. When you, when you, you know, you have a car, you buy your car, it's mandatory. You know, it's a federal law for you to have insurance, right? And the purpose of that insurance is so that if you ever get in a crash, you neither you or the party, you know, the other party involved will be stuck, right? Because, you know, it's very, vehicle repair is very expensive here in the US. So when you have car insurance, if, God forbid, if someone hits you or you hit someone, the insurance will pay them out. They will fix their car or get them a new car. So they are not stuck. Their livelihood is not taken away right? But although you have insurance, the fact that you have insurance and you have very good insurance and the fact that you won't pay out of pocket if you hit someone does not mean you will not go ahead and start crashing your car every day, <laughs> right? Because if you do that repeatedly enough, first of all, your insurance premium will go up. So that's the insurance company telling you, you are reckless. The reason we are giving you this insurance is not so that you can be reckless. It's for emergencies, not for everyday use, right? Now, you know, and secondly, the fact that, you know, you have insurance doesn't mean, you know, you now completely ignore all of the road laws, you ignore your safety precautions, you, you, you drive anyhow. No, the goal of the insurance is to give you peace of mind when you make mistakes, when there are factors beyond your control. So that you don't pay the price for your mistakes when you could not avoid them. That's the idea behind the mercy of God. So the fact that God is merciful doesn't now mean that I now begin to live carelessly, right? The fact that God will show me mercy doesn't mean I cannot begin to do whatever I want. That's not the idea. And unfortunately, those who do not understand the mercy of God properly or who have been taught the mercy of God out of proportion, they enter into licentiousness. Right, and that's where you begin to hear doctrines like the moment you are born again, whatever you do doesn't matter anymore. God has forgiven all your sins, both your past, present, and future sins. So now <laughs> you are the righteousness of God. You can do whatever you want. But the same scripture says, "Little children, let him that is righteous do righteousness. He that he says he that doeth righteousness is righteous." There is a righteousness that is in nature that you receive on the basis of your standing in Christ. But there is also a righteousness that is based on your works. Now, it is not what you do that makes you righteous. But the idea is, when you are righteous, you should do righteousness. That's the idea. It's just like saying, um, you know, um, 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 how do I explain it? You know, it's like you are a man. The reason you are a man is because there are, there are some morphological features in you that are characteristic of men. And because you are a man, you should act like a man. You should do what men do. So it is not what you do that makes you a man. It's a nature that is, first of all, imparted into you. So on the basis of your revelation of that nature, you then begin to do the things that are consistent with what men do. 
right? That is how it is. So you are made righteous because of the sacrifice of Jesus, but because of that nature of righteousness that you have now received, you must then now begin to act out the righteousness. So it is, it is a great contradiction for you to now claim to be righteous and be manifesting fruits of unrighteousness. That is a contradiction. And it, that is not taught by the scriptures. So the idea of the mercy of God is when you make mistakes so that you do not have to, you do not have to face the full rot of the devil's wrath, you know, the devil's judgment, the mercy of God can step in and say, yes, you messed up. Yes, you must be it, but I can still turn this around for your good. And that is the reason why the scripture then says that we know that all things work together for good. All things, including your mistakes, all things, including your bad decisions, all things, including your, your missed opportunities, all things, including the seasons that you have missed, all things can then work together for you. The reason all things can work together for you is on the basis of the mercy of God. And that is the reason why we can confidently go through life. That is the reason why we don't dwell on our past. That is the reason why we don't dwell on our mistakes. That is the, as long as we are human, we will make mistakes. There are times that, you know, God gives you an instruction. You genuinely wanted to do it, but Somehow you just lost focus, you just became careless, and you, 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 you couldn't do it, and you missed a season. The fact that you have made that mistake doesn't mean you are done for for life. It doesn't mean your life will be ruined and destroyed. No. The mercy of God becomes your insurance policy that you can leverage on and say, Father, because of your mercy, Father, turn things around for my good. And you will be amazed that that mistake you made that looks as though is the greatest disadvantage of your life can become the reason why God promotes you to the next level. For example, look at the life of David. He made a terrible mistake. He saw another man's wife, you know, not only did he take her, not only did he impregnate her, he took the man himself and killed the man. So not only did he commit adultery, he also committed murder. And at the end of it all, when he took the woman to become his wife, you know, God judged him by you know, not allowing that the, the child of that iniquity to live. But it was through that same woman, it was through that same union that the king that succeeded him in the person of Solomon was born. It was that same woman that he took wrongly that eventually gave birth to Solomon. And the Bible says the Lord loved Solomon. You know, there are sort of the kind of scriptures that when I think about, I'm just amazed. Ah, who, what kind of God is this? That you, a man committed such a grievous atrocity. And instead of you to, to, to hate him and everything that comes out of his bloodline, the Bible says the child that came from that same woman, it says God loved Solomon. That's to tell you that when God forgives you, your past is wiped away. When God says, I show you mercy, it doesn't matter what you have done. It is water under the bridge. That is how powerful the mercy of God is. So what you consider to be your greatest mistake, what you consider to be the worst decision you have made can become the basis for which God promotes you to the next level. It can become the reason why you become wiser. It can become the reason why you make better decisions tomorrow. It can become the reason why God can now trust you with greater things. Because he knows, because you have made this mistake and you have learned from it and you have made up your mind not to go back to it, not to repeat the same mistakes again, he knows he cannot trust you with more significant things. I pray the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Now I'm going to stop there for today. Can we just go to the Lord in prayer and say, Father, thank you for your mercy. Can we just thank the Lord for his mercy? Just, just think about all of the, the lengths that God has to go through just to be able to show you mercy. Think about the, 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 the level of complexities that God has to navigate in order to just make sure he shows you mercy. In order to just make sure we are not disadvantaged in life. In order to make sure we are not at the mercy of the devil. This our God is an amazing God. He's our God is love. He is, he, is, he is beyond what words can describe. His word is love is beyond what words can describe. Can you thank the Lord for his love? I don't care what you are going through right now. I don't care how difficult it looks to you. But can you forget about your problems and just say, Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you for your mercy. Father, I thank you for your love. I didn't know you loved me this much. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for your compassion. That a man could say instead of receiving, ju to re to, to receiving justice for myself, no, I choose to administer the justice to them. I choose to administer the justice and the blessings to those who will believe in me. He relinquished his rights to justice and he gave, he gave you the benefit. He gave me the benefit. That is how amazing his love is. Can you just worship the Lord and say, Father, I thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Father, thank you. 
Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Because I no longer have to bear the judgment of my foolish men, the consequences of my bad decision. Because if I rely on your mercy, you can still turn all things around for my good. Oh, Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you. When you understand this, there is no way the devil can pin you down in the valley of regret anymore. Because you know the mercy of God can bring me out. It doesn't matter how bad I messed up. It doesn't matter how bad I, I, I fumbled. It doesn't matter how, how bad my decision, my mistake was by the mercy of God I can come out. Can you just bless the Lord and say, Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. As we are doing that, can you now ask God for his mercy? Like I said, the mercy of God is not only for sinners. Every single one of us need the mercy of God from day to day. It is by the mercy of God we are able to approach God. Can you pray and say, Father, have mercy on me. Father, show me your mercy in the name of Jesus. Can you list the areas of your life that you are struggling with right now and plead for the mercy of God? Father, intervene in this situation. Show me your mercy. Maybe your own is academics. You have been struggling. Can you ask God to show you mercy? Maybe your own is financial. Can you ask God to show you mercy? Maybe your own is marital. Can you ask God to show you mercy? Maybe your own is in your health. Can you ask God to show you mercy? Father, show me mercy. Father, have mercy on me. Father, have mercy on me. Father, have mercy on me. One of the ways that we can provoke divine intervention is by leveraging the mercy of God. I taught us last week that one of the ways to provoke divine intervention is through covenant. And not that way we can, we can provoke divine intervention is by, is by leveraging on the mercy of God and requesting for God's mercy. Can you say, Father, have mercy on me in the name of Jesus. Father, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Before we go tonight, I'd like to give opportunity to someone who wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, like I was explaining during the teaching, the concept of the mercy of God is only freely available to those who have received, who believe in the sacrifice of Jesus. Those are the people who can partake of the will. So if you are here tonight, you are not sure whether you are born again. You are not sure whether you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you want to be sure tonight. You want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Can you just place your hand on your chest? And say this simple prayer after me, but please mean it from the depth of your heart. Just tell him, Lord Jesus, I recognize myself as a sinner. And I know you died to set me free. Lord Jesus, I believe in you and the sacrifice that you made for me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me today. Come into my heart. Become my Lord and my Savior. Wash my sins away and give me the power to go and to sin no more. From this day, I declare that I will live for you and you alone. Thank you, Jesus, because you have saved me. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word that you have sent to us. I pray for those who have decided to accept you as Lord and Savior, that you wash their sins away and the power to go and to sin no more, you release into their lives in the name of Jesus. I pray for every one of us, the grace to always leverage on your mercy from day to day so that our life can become a mystery to our world. Father, release into our lives in Jesus' name. Father, by all means, show us mercy in the name of Jesus. As we go into this week, Oh God, let our testimony be a testimony of mercy in all our endeavors in the mighty name of Jesus. And by the time we we'll come together again next week, let us come back rejoicing. Thank you, Holy Father, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed.